Professor Scott Howard, who is the CEO of the Resonance, uh, former secretary of SIOP. And we are very happy that uh, he is uh, the deputy director of uh, Yolian Hematology and Oncology Center of Armenia. Welcome, Professor Howard. Uh, it is a great pleasure to have you here. And um, I will introduce uh, the other speakers and then we can start uh, with the topics. Uh, Please welcome Dr. Uh, Rabat uh, Rihani, uh, who is a pediatric oncologist working in King Hussein Cancer Center in uh, Jordan, uh, where she is an associate member, the deputy chairman in the Department of Pediatrics, a consultant in the Depa Department of Pediatric Hematology and Oncology, and the consultant in the uh, Department of Bone Marrow and Stem Cell Transplantation. Uh, she is the deputy chairperson of the Institutional Review Board of the King Hussein Cancer Center, and welcome. Welcome, Dr. Uh, Rihani. Uh, again, it's um, an honor uh, for us to have you during our Oncoton. And uh, our uh, next uh, speaker is uh, Korede Akindale from uh, Nigeria, who is the Director of Programs Pediatric Cancer Advocate and uh, Policy Driver. Uh, he's um, uh, well, very well, uh, very active uh, in uh, SIOP, and uh, he's the, the young SIOP uh, chair. So, uh, welcome all. Uh, I think um, Corrida will uh, join a little bit late. So, let's start with Professor Howard, and then at the end, we will have a discussion uh, with a couple of questions. Thank you so much, Shushan, for hosting this, and thank you, Anko Daily. I'd also like to thank Anko Heroes for sponsoring um, this whole event, and I hope everybody can pitch in to get some of these new medicines out into the field as quickly as possible. I'm also really happy um, because my topic is to talk about some barriers to treating cancer in the low- and middle-income countries. So the problems we heard about from Italy and from the U.S., mostly relapse, right? You heard six relapses. So what a heartbreaking thing to think your child might be cured. And then a month later, six months later, a year later, the cancer's back a second time, a third time, a fourth time, a fifth time. And although 80% of children with cancer can be cured, 20% are not. And those 20% have a heartbreaking course with multiple relapses until finally the cancer takes their life. So we have work to do. We have work to do in high income countries to get the 20% cured. And we have work to do everywhere else, first to get to 80% and then to get to 100%. And so when you think about the reasons people don't get cured in low and middle income countries, relapse is still very, very important and very common. So if we address relapse, we've helped everybody everywhere. So getting new medicines out the door and getting people access to those medicines, of course, it doesn't do any good if a medicine is beautiful, but it's only available in one country and none of the others. So we have to not only get the medicine produced, but get it out the door and into every door. But relapse is not the only problem. The first problem is not even getting diagnosed. And about a third of children in the entire world right now today don't ever get diagnosed with cancer. And when I say they don't get diagnosed, they do get diagnosed after they've died. So being diagnosed by autopsy is not the way to diagnose a cancer. You know they had cancer, but you, it was too late to cure it because by the time they got the diagnosis, they had already died. So that's number one is no diagnosis. Number two though, is a wrong diagnosis or a diagnosis that's not quite right. So sometimes people say, well, it's lymphoma and they're correct, it's a lymphoma. But in children, there's actually four types of lymphoma and each of the four has different treatment. So even if you say, if you, even if you got it almost right, you got the lymphoma part right, you need to know exactly which type of lymphoma. So getting a diagnosis, number one, getting a correct diagnosis is number two. And then the third is access to any treatment at all. And unfortunately, in some places, the patient has to bear the cost of treatment and the cost of treatment is sometimes a hundred times their annual income. So just so far out of reach, you can't even imagine in some places, okay, we'll sell the house, we'll borrow from all the neighbors and friends and find a way to get this child through. But it's sometimes even all of that is still falls hundredfold short of what is necessary. So access to treatment is the third big, big potential barrier. And then death from toxicity. Some of the treatments are quite toxic, especially the old treatments. They call them cytotoxic therapy because it's toxic to cells. And unfortunately, it's toxic to the cancer cells. That's great. 
it's unfortunately it's also toxic to the regular cells. So we want to get away from the cytotoxic therapies and get to the new therapies that go directly at the cancer itself and get those new therapies to every child. And then the last thing I wanted to mention is abandonment of treatment. And abandonment of treatment is when a patient would get a diagnosis, even get a correct diagnosis, have access to treatment, get started on the treatment, maybe even have a good response to the treatment, and then just disappear and not come back. And so the official definition is you go away for four weeks in a row, no follow-up, no treatment, that's abandonment. But the reason for that four weeks is because after four weeks of disappearing, hardly anybody comes back until the child has relapsed. And once they relapse, then they come back, but it's too late to really help because the relapse cancer is very hard to treat. So these are five barriers to treatment of children everywhere. And together, I know we can address them. I uh, really appreciate you guys organizing this Oncathon. I think it's a brilliant idea. And I also love that um, all of us who are here following the, the live stream um, can hopefully reach into our pocket and help some children with cancer. Also, I was just yesterday in Dr. Rihani's hospital, and I really thank you for hosting me. So too much fun to be with you again here. Well, that's a coincidence, uh, yes, and a, a good one. So thank you, Professor Howard, uh, for your um, for sharing uh, the key points uh, that uh, we usually face uh, while treating patients uh, in low middle income countries. And uh, I would like to uh, give the microphone to uh, Dr. Rihani, and at the end we will uh, discuss um, together. Thank you very much for hosting me and thank you for the Oncothone and the uh, Onco Heroes as well. And I'm really grateful to be here with the Scott um, uh, on, on this topic. I think the theme for this year is actually discussing the uh, all the challenges and uh, for treating childhood cancer and the barriers to care. So uh, we do continue as we improve our survival curve, we do continue to have patients who don't have access to uh, the essential medicine, not just only the relapse patients. We continue to have patients upfront. They don't have the upfront treatment for simple treatment of childhood cancer. So I would like to get an uh, give an example of that. For example, displaced children, children and refugees, um, they don't have the basic right to access those treatment, simple treatment with diseases that are highly curable. Uh, so there is a really um, large inequity here and uh, lack of access for such patients, unfortunately, and they fall into the cracks of the different systems as they immigrate or they are displaced from their own uh, countries. Um, we still do have uh, examples of these patients uh, in our population, unfortunately, and we're trying to help as much as we can. Um, and there are lots of examples elsewhere in the in the world, and I would like also to highlight uh, the uh, uh, the other part, which is uh, access to novel therapies and uh, novel uh, medications, uh, such as immune therapy, for example. Not everyone, um, uh, especially in our part of the world, uh, it, even with the advancement that we have taken uh, to cure our children with with cancer, we still don't have access to um, immune therapy medications, to, for especially for relapse or refractory uh, disease and leukemias, uh, monoclonal uh, uh, also antibodies uh, are not available and they're highly expensive that cannot be affordable uh, by our governments or health systems. And um, that really affects the survival in the majority of patients, for example. Um, uh, and this is one of the gaps that, that we do have. Um, in a CAR T-cell program, uh, I, I mean, I know when at the time when we are discussing upfront therapy or simple medications for uh, curing childhood cancer, but also at the same time, we have to you know, consider that percentage of patients that still are not curable with the regular or upfront medications. So the, the newer fancy uh, immune therapy techniques are lacking, of course, uh, when we talk about the disparities, they're only available in high income countries uh, and within the context of clinical trials or uh, research projects. And this, these are uh, areas that are lacking in, the part, in our part of the world. So as a result, uh, our patients who are refractory or relapsed are, are left with no options uh, to treat or with a high financial burden 
put on the uh, the treating centers or the families. And you know, with this knowledge that there is something that can be done, but they don't have access to that. I think this is uh, really put a lot of distress on everyone, and that's one of the area that we probably would like to address. Also, um, lack of access to uh, molecular testing and genetic testing and accurate uh, disease diagnosis that Dr. Howard uh, referred to. This is something that's not available for all centers. And uh, also, in even uh, advanced centers, uh, we do still have uh, gaps in, in, in this knowledge and these techniques to, for accurate and molecular diagnosis and uh, which with implications on therapy, of course, so this can be really translated into accurate therapy for these tumors. So the, these, there's, lack, there's lack in this, of, uh, of course. And um, uh, definitely also uh, there is inequity in the financial uh, support in some countries uh, that are poor, they don't have, um, you know, a high financial sort of budget to treat childhood cancer. And in some countries, this is not one of the priority, priority areas. And um, as we are not as pediatric uh, oncologists and uh, pediatric cancer, it's not a really fancy um, and attractive field for pharma companies to, to invest in clinical trials uh, as when we compare it to adults. So uh, I think these are really continue to, to be uh, areas that, uh, that needs to be addressed. And we hope that we can um, uh, close the gap in these areas, uh, especially for frontline uh, treatment in, in areas where the survival rate that are uh, still 20%, and which is really not acceptable at, at an era where uh, childhood cancer is highly curable. Absolutely agree with both of you. Uh, you uh, highlighted all the uh, things uh, that we all face uh, in our daily practice, uh, clinical practice. But uh, my question uh, is for both of you. So uh, everyone, each of us uh, are doing our best uh, in the clinic, uh, in some scientific part uh, to uh, advance uh, the pediatric cancer research. but. What else you think that is lacking uh, that uh, could be uh, the solution uh, for fast and um, for fast uh, uh, improvement uh, in pediatric cancer research? Would you like to go first, um, Dr. Rahani? Um, so I guess for me, um, maybe uh, uh, you know, funding uh, some clinical protocols in our areas of the world so that the patients can be enrolled in them and can have access to these ther therapies. And also maybe looking at centralization of uh, diagnostic methodologies, helping with that so that at least if we don't have, at least to provide the access for these, for these uh, diagnostic methods, especially those who that, that really would contribute dramatically to the outcomes of the treatment. I guess um, this is this is an area that's lacking in our world. Uh, this uh, this part of our world where clinical trials and and joining uh, or enrolling patients on these such trials that can be really helpful and also can be uh, providing access to such drugs, uh, I think can be one of the solutions. The other thing is rallying and maybe calling for action. From, like, from platforms such as uh, Oncothon to uh, rally for pharma to consider, um, you know, lowering prices for medications, uh, highly expensive medications that are essential for the cure of childhood cancer. And also maybe, um, you know, finding platforms that will provide these um, uh, medicines for uh, reaching children everywhere in the world. And I think example of that is uh, the essential medicine platform with WHO, St. Jude, etc., can be an example of that. But I think we need more of this. And when I, I think decision makers in different pharma and different um, working group need to really uh, think about the prices of medi medications, especially for our area of the world. That's yeah. why I wanted you to go first, because I was going to say the exact same thing, and uh, you said it great. And um, in fact, I really personally have gone all in on exactly what um, Professor Rihani just said, which is how do you get access? 
And it was so encouraging when you think about some people don't even have access to the cheapest, oldest, like mercaptopurine. This pill was invented in 1953. 71 years later, it still costs pennies per pill. So one US dollar, you can get enough treatment for a half a month for one child. So it's nothing, and it's so important for children with a certain type of leukemia. So that's all the way from mercaptopurine. So then suddenly, thank you, St. Jude and World Health Organization and UNICEF for, in a way, solving that problem, which is to bring a basket of all the most essential, most useful things, even if they're cheap or if they're expensive, but most essential as defined by the WHO's list of essential medicines for children with cancer. And just say, here, have this whole package and use whatever money you save that you might have been able to buy some of this. Use that money to help pay for your nurses to be trained and help, you know, develop a better pharmacy process. So that money shouldn't disappear from cancer and, you know, maybe go buy something else, but it can still support children with cancer as they receive these free medicines. They can then receive that money can build the things around those medicines to cure the patient. But what that problem won't solve are access to the newest medicines. And some of these new medicines are like magic, um, uh, just to name a few. So there's one like, a, like a Dr. Rihani mentioned, uh, immunotherapy. So blinitumumab, this thing raises the cure rate for children with the most common leukemia by 15, 20%. So here you have a drug that is plus 15% on a disease that's already almost 85% curable. That's exactly what we needed, right? To get to 100. But who's going to be able to get it? It costs so much. So how can we get access in a timely way? Eventually, everyone will get it. And in fact, Amgen, who is the maker of this product, is, has a donation program for the poorest countries. They, they don't even try to sell it. They just give it. But still very complicated to even to set up a donation program. It takes a lot of work and a lot of time and effort. And many children are lost while that time and effort is being invested. So my thought and my plan and my personal uh, goal in life has been to develop clinical trials in low and middle income countries. And why a clinical trial? It sounds dumb when I just said sometimes you don't even get a diagnosis of cancer and now you're talking about a clinical trial. Well, the reason is, sure, we need to work on diagnosis. But once you get a diagnosis, if you can have access sometimes to the new thing, sometimes it puts you from 20 percent to 70 percent this new thing. So when the new thing is so good, the only thing that matters is can you get the new thing or not? And so one way to get it is to have a clinical trial where it's free, it's study drug. And what does the pharma company get in exchange? They get the data, the precious information they need to go get the approval of FDA and European Medicines Agency and, and Jordanian Medicines Agency and the Armenian Medicines Agency. All of these people need data. So Onco Heroes, you heard him, what he said. He can't study these three promising drugs because he needs more money. One reason he needs more money is that research in the US and Europe is very, very, very very expensive. So we're solving two problems, increase access by getting children in middle income countries access to the research. And we can do the research at a lower price point so that they can do research. They can have a lower threshold. Maybe he doesn't need $100 million. Maybe he needs $10 million. It's still too much, but it's very hard to get 100. It's hard to get 10, but it's 10 times easier than getting 100. Let's just say. So I don't know how much they need, but if we could uh, make the most economic way to come to Jordan, come to Armenia. We welcome your research projects. Um, if you're from a pharma company listening to this, and also I have personally developed a contract research organization specifically dedicated to bringing trials to places like the ones that we're talking about here. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, you both uh, highlighted and emphasized the, the key points, the important things that uh, we as a pediatric oncologist in, um, working in low middle income countries should always uh, be aware. And also we should urge uh, companies, industries and uh, regulatory uh, institutions to uh, work uh, also with us uh, as uh, we also have patients uh, and uh, they need uh, the same care that uh, is available in uh, high uh, income countries.